Support for In the Frame, Exploring the DIA is provided by Masco Corporation Foundation. Masco is a global manufacturer of home improvement and building products. Hello and welcome to In the Frame Exploring the DIA. Today we're going to be looking at an exhibition organized by the DIA called Through African Eyes. It's a complex exhibition that explores the relationship between the European and the African, mainly the West African, from the first contact in the early 16th century by the Portuguese to today. I clearly remember as a young schoolboy in 1957 going into the assembly hall to find it decked out with wonderful bunting, red, yellow, and green. The back wall of the stage was a sign saying, the Gold Coast is now Ghana. And the principal then stood up and gave us a short lecture about how we and our great generosity as part of the British Commonwealth were giving Ghana their independence. In other words, we were handing their country back to them. The story I learned in the 1950s was one of a great imperial enterprise. I heard about brave soldiers, bold merchants, courageous missionaries who went on a civilizing mission to around the world, but especially Africa. Well, now the civilizing mission was complete and the British were very generously beginning to give the countries back uh, to the indigenous inhabitants. Today, we hear a very, very different story. We hear about brutality, exploitation, we hear about ignorant missionaries. We hear about exploitative merchants who did everything they could to extract what they could from the Africans, including people themselves. But it's much more complicated than that. And today, taking you through this complicated story is the organizer of this exhibition, Ni Kwakapong, curator of African art at the Detroit Institute of Arts. This exhibition deals with how African artists have documented and interpreted their cultures' relationships with Europeans over the past five centuries. Since 1450, when the first Portuguese ships arrived on the coast of West and Central Africa, Africans have engaged Europeans and have interacted with Europeans. The artistic forms that you see in this exhibition attempt to document how African artists have viewed this relationship. The art objects include both sculptures and utilitarian objects. They are also objects that have been used in traditional circles in Africa, as well as objects that were made exclusively for Europeans. Some objects also come from African private collections, including chiefly treasures. And this is something that makes this exhibition extraordinary. There are additional elements in this exhibition that make it so different from other exhibitions that have preceded it. The first is the fact that we are attempting in this exhibition to emphasize the African perspective, to emphasize how Africans have seen these relationships evolve over time rather than how Western scholars have seen them, which has always been how the scholarship has presented the interpretations of the works that you are going to see in this exhibition. The exhibition is also about how complex African societies existed long before Europeans you know, arrived on the continent and how these societies were transformed as a result of their interactions with Europeans. This first section deals with the very early encounters between Europeans and Africans. This encounter, for most Africans, was a jarring experience since um, African cultures have um, always associated whiteness with spirit identities. For Europeans to come off large boats 
on the ocean, which was also an abode of spirits, made them look like they were spirits coming onto the land. Many Africans considered this to be um, very, very, very um, astonishing. Some Africans deserted their communities. Others um, were only able to interact with Europeans after a lengthy period of uh, anxiety. What we find in this section, the first two objects that you see to my left actually try to capture this pre-existing African notion of spirit identity and its connection with white pigmentation. We've also tried in this section to capture some of the early attempts by Africans who saw these Europeans as exotic characters to represent these Europeans by capturing aspects of the European persona, aspects of European dress that they considered totally different from theirs and therefore um, um, meriting artistic representation. In this section too, what we have done is to focus on the few African cultures that have been able to document these early encounters in artistic representation. Many African cultures don't have permanent art forms or art forms created in permanent material. In the case of Benin, the Kingdom of Benin, which currently has the longest running dynasty in sub-Saharan Africa, we see works in brass that were made by Benin artists that capture some of the early Portuguese encounters. And you'll find on the right side some of these um, early, um, early sculptures that come from Benin. Not long after the early encounters, as mutual apprehension and anxieties subsided on both sides, Africans and Europeans started trading, and the trading relationship um, brought in lots of goods from Europe as Europeans brought goods from the Mediterranean area along the west coast and then central African coast. Um, they took back with them um, ivory, gold and spices, animal skins, but brought in rum, metalware, textile, sugar, guns and beads. The Portuguese ships also went further south and then all the way to Southeast Asia, which brought in additional material and com commodities that were unfamiliar to Africans. This expanded the trade considerably and enriched many African groups that lived along the coast. We have here a representation of an early Benin messenger figure. He's supposed to be a royal messenger, um, and that um, royal messenger, by virtue of the um, elements associated with his outfit, clearly points to somebody who belonged to a guild a special guild that the Benin kingship set up to, put, to protect the Portuguese um, when they came in to trade. In addition, to the left of it is um, a sculpture, um, it's a plaque that was made purposely to decorate the interior of the palace. And what you see in the center is a figure of the Portuguese um, shown uh, wearing his splitted skirt, a tight-fitting jacket, with sword and then a spear in the right hand. But he is surrounded by horseshoe-shaped items. These horseshoe-shaped items are references to copper manilas that were imported in large quantities by the Portuguese. Copper manilas were ingots, raw copper ingots that were imported in large quantities. They became currency in Benin and then eventually they became a monopoly of the royal family. And so many of these sculptures, the brass sculptures that you see, may have even been um, made out of melted down copper ingots that were used um, in the brass casting process. Since the royal family was 
the, uh, was the sole owner of all the copper that was brought into the, into the uh, kingdom. Uh, you can see it reflected in the, um, in the beautiful brass works that were all also associated exclusively with the Benin leadership. As the trade with the Portuguese progressed, the people of Benin began to see the Portuguese as harbingers of wealth. And because the royal family of Benin monopolized the trade, they began to also look to the Portuguese for additional wealth that was accrued by the, uh, by the courts. The interesting thing in Benin's royal art is that we begin to see how the Portuguese face became a symbol of prosperity. And you can see the Portuguese face represented here alongside um, representations of leopards, which are um, the leopard symbol was the emblem of royal authority. And so for the Portuguese to be represented on the same level as uh, um, the royal symbol is a clear indication of the importance that was attached to the Portuguese presence by the kingship. We also have to the left of it um, a representation of a Portuguese face as, as a pendant that was worn by a Benin chief who perhaps had influence in the trade. But this would have been given to that chief by the king of Benin. And therefore, these are elements that clearly point to the increasing importance of the Portuguese, uh, largely because of the number of goods that they brought in and the wealth that accrued to the court. While many commodities were part of the trade, this section deals with human trafficking, slavery, which became an important component of the trade um, between the early Portuguese and Europeans. Slavery continued long after the Portuguese had left 200 years later. But one of the things that we find in African art that is also distressing is the fact that very few pictorial representations of slavery exist in African art. And what this exhibition has done, that previous exhibitions have not done is to find these objects and to bring, bring them into this exhibition context so that the visitors can get a sense of how Africans saw slavery, how they represented them, and the kinds of messages that they wove into the representations of slavery. We have a few objects here um, that show um, the African representation of slavery. We have this beautiful carved ivory tusk from the Luango coast of the Congo. Um, you'll find in sections of this uh, tusk uh, representations of slaves bound b around the neck, um, being led into waiting European ships, um, along with representations of African leaders and Europeans transacting business. The idea behind this, out of the four objects that we have on display here, is to draw attention to the African complicity in the trade. The fact that certain members of the African elite in some cultures, not all cultures, participated in this horrific activity. It is also critical for us to see how detailed the artists uh, get in their uh, representation of the human interaction that, um, attend, that, you know, that was associated with slavery. But one of the things that we also find exciting about this piece is the fact that the artist places a monkey figure at the top and then places one small monkey figure under a table where you see an African and European um, and, and, and having a, a business discussion. And we've seen that you know, images like this tend to have multiple meanings. And that's the kind of thing that we, we, we try to drive home throughout this exhibition, pointing out to people that many of these forms sometimes have multiple uh, messages woven into them and that is, the, that is one thing that you find consistently throughout the exhibition and wherever we've got the opportunity to bring this to the attention of the, uh, of the vista, we do so. In this case, it's much more of um, a subtext that the artist uh, introduces the monkey figure as a representation of the greed and avarice that was, sh was shared between the European and the African uh, leaders.
Africans also took advantage of European settlement to observe the European lifestyle. The couple that you see here um, was made by an African artist among the Yoruba people of southwestern Nigeria and they comment on the lifestyle of a, a colonial European couple. Here you have two tightly dressed European figures. Um, the hats that they are wearing were carved separately. The bag was carved separately. Then the dog on the leash was also carved separately. And the idea here is to drive home the point that Europeans love to be always dressed up. And then in addition, the artist also was commenting on the privileged position of dogs in European life. The idea also is to communicate the fact that um, in African culture generally, dogs serve two main purposes. One is to guard the house, and two is to lead the hunt. To see a dog being given this really, really uh, majestic position is to declare in the European life the position of the dog as a leader rather than as, uh, as an animal um, that uh, performed specific roles. So this is one way by which a Yoruba artist carving mainly for the tourist market was trying to drive home this point. And to think of this work with all its intricate parts carved separately, the amount of time that this artist spent carving this piece to be sold for perhaps less than a dollar is something that clearly points to the importance that the artists attached to the cultural difference between Europeans and Africans. From the very first encounters between Africans and Europeans, Africans became fascinated with European technology. The big ships that arrived on the coast were fascinating largely because compared to the canoes, the small dugout canoes that they used was small. European technological innovations became um, so important in African culture largely because they provided Africans another insight into some of the so-called mystical attributes of Europeans. This car here that you see is a Mercedes-Benz. It's a replica of a 1980s Mercedes-Benz car, um, but it is not a car to be driven. It is actually a coffin for somebody to be buried in. Coffins were introduced as a result of British, uh, a British colonial decree asking local population not to bury um, they are dead on mats, but rather to be buried in boxes. A local artist actually went out of his way to create these extraordinary forms um, in the 1950s, and it has since become part of the culture of southern Ghana among the Ga people. This coffin is actually a reference to a person who, um, during his lifetime, acquired enough wealth to, uh, to be able to, um, to own a Mercedes. Under normal circumstances, the license plate, the original license plate would have been copied onto the car and the person would have really um, entered the afterlife in style. In, in other respects too, the reference is to how swiftly a person can travel. So to travel from this world into the afterlife um, in a Mercedes-Benz car is not only traveling in something that is prestigious but also something that is faster and therefore you can reach the afterlife faster. By 1960, Europeans had packed and moved out of Africa. They were no longer colonial powers and Africans felt free to engage the rest of the Western world on their own. America became the focus of African attention and American culture began to dominate African lives. What we have in this section is the artistic forms. It's a, a corpus of artistic forms that show how the term European itself expanded considerably during the post-1960 era to include not only white Americans, but also African Americans and Africans in the diaspora. What we have here 
is a barber shop sign, which would have been carried by an itinerant barber marketing his trade in the inner city of South, of South in Ghana. And you have here representations of um, Tupac Shakur, we have uh, Will Smith, and then even Barack Obama. This piece was done in 2009, right after the elections. It is a clear indication the important role that African-American celebrities are playing in the lives of uh, young Africans who are fantasizing about um, their connections with the West. They, knew, they know very well that they cannot travel to the West. They don't have the means to travel. They don't have the opportunity to travel, but at least they can fantasize about their connections with these um, African-American celebrities who are the symbols of wealth and prosperity and achievement in, in within the circles of you know, these young Africans. And so what we've introduced here is just one of many, many artistic forms that are emerging in the inner cities that show the strength of American culture in African societies. In addition, we're also drawing peop uh, to people's attention the fact that Africans are now not interested so much in engaging physically with Euro uh, Europeans and Americans, but can still access American culture through the internet, through the print media, through the radio, through um, uh, the, the, um, the cinema, and other um, means of modern technologies. And I think that's, this is a, a great way by which the exhibition really turns attention away from the stereotypical European to a very, very, very broadly based um, and the Westerner, uh, which all of us are a part of. This show is about perception. And what we've done throughout the exhibition in the various thematic installations that we've put in place is to demonstrate to people that one, Africa is not one culture, it's many cultures, each of which has had a different relationship with um, a European entity. And Europeans also don't represent one culture, but represent many different cultures. And part of the exhibition is to show that the relationships that developed between Africans and Europeans over time, over the 500 year period, have been dynamic. We are also trying to draw people's attention to the fact that there can be multiple perspectives on every object. The interpretation of the objects as we present them here cannot always be certain because we don't know the motivations of the artists who produce them. You can never walk away from this exhibition thinking that you've learned everything about Africa. You have to come back to it many, many times and I hope that everybody gets the opportunity to see it many, many times. I've been a member here at the Detroit Institute of Arts for about 12 years. And 11 of those years, I, I've been a volunteer. And it came from taking an art history course at Wayne State University. And after taking that course and realizing we have some of those pieces of artwork from the book here, I thought how extraordinary for me. So I decided I want to become a volunteer here. There are a couple of things I, I enjoy out of volunteering here at the DIA. The first thing is that uh, I've met a lot of really great people. And it's such a great place too. It's so magnificent. It's one of the best jewels I think that the city has to offer. And then I think the third thing really is the opportunity for leadership. It really is prevalent here and there's so many opportunities. You can learn about behind the scenes at the DIA, you can be on the front lines, meeting all kinds of people. It's really been an extraordinary experience. I think, I think having the Detroit Institute of Arts being in our uh, backyard is absolutely important. I think that every major city across the United States, and really all across the world, should be well-rounded and well-balanced, and art absolutely provides that. It's inspiring, and artwork gets created, and then you get inspired again, and it's really symbiotic, and I think that really balances out the human being. If you haven't been down here in a while, come on down.
I hope you enjoyed this episode of In the Frame with an inside look at a groundbreaking exhibition. I'm happy to say that when the exhibition closes here, it's going on the road to other cities in the US. For information on programs at the DIA, you can go to dia.org. Until next time, this is Graham Beale, your guide to one of America's great art museums, the Detroit Institute of Arts. Support for In the Frame, Exploring the DIA is provided by Masco Corporation Foundation. Masco is a global manufacturer of home improvement and building products. An encore presentation of In the Frame is available on demand for viewing at DetroitPublicTV.org.